it doesn't. That's his tractor. It, we bang. It, we bang. Well, it's W E I Wubong. It's a Chinese okay. company. Okay. Okay. <laughs> You, you might not believe me. The eye fell off. <laughs> and so I put it back in a different way. Oh. That'd be real well, farmer I style. Wanna, I, and you need like a, what, it's one of those little sec second cabbie. Yeah, with the, with the helmet. With the helmet. I'm like, like here on the side. Yeah, this is my tractor. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like this is a persimmon that came from just spitting a seed out. <laughs> Strategically. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming into like mid succession in some areas. I remember planting this as a tiny baby. Oh my goodness, it looks like it got hit by, did it get hit by lightning or something? There was a crazy windstorm and okay. this whole branch set sheared out. Yeah. I should have cleaned it up, but I, just, I cleaned it enough that the load was off. It looks like it, um, it's um, favored by sap suckers too. Yeah, there yeah. might be some issues with this tree in the long run, but I, I, they'll figure it out. I mean, pecan, it's just so strong. Yeah, it's sweet. And the year that I planted this tree, and it started growing, I think was the same year that a squirrel planted that shagbark hickory. hickory yeah. <laughs> and so amazing. now they're, I think they're about the same age. And I wonder mm -hmm. if the pollen between the pecan and the hickory have been shared oh. and whether or not their offspring will be a hybrid between the two. Well, that'll be I, really I interesting. Uh, and the, has this produced nuts for you yet? It made one or two last year. It is making a whole bunch this year. The squirrel life in this landscape is, is intense. Yeah. And we're very passive for now since we don't live here full time and they do. Uh, we're just letting them take everything they want. So Amazing. almost certainly the hickory will get zero from here, but there's enough elsewhere. I think it's gonna be a really good hickory nut year because our hickories are full. Every tree that could make a mast crop that I have observed is at peak. Yeah. It, this is probably the most abundant fall of tree crop production that I've seen in my whole life. Wow. It's really exciting. It's yeah. very interesting to hear that because obviously we just got on our land, so we're, we don't have any reference point. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to see that. But we went for a walk in the woods today and we we're like, wow, these hickories are just loaded. Yeah, yeah. you came on the land at like the peak, mo just set your expectations appropriately that okay. like in years <laughs> in the future. So what you, if you harvest hickory now and you dry them and store them in a rodent protected way, yeah. Uh, we have hickories that were good six years later. Okay. Eight, eight to ten years is yeah. about the max of how far, if you store them in a root cellar condition or like cool, dry, yeah. they can last almost a decade. Oh, wow. So when okay. we get a year like this to go so strong on harvest and collection yeah. and then run with that, next year might be nothing. Yeah, we so might want to collect some. For collect sure. for three years yeah. and yeah. see what that does. Is for this you. like a chestnut or? This is a chestnut. And what kind of chestnut? Oh, some sort of mutt, probably. <laughs> I probably Chinese dominant. I traded three valerian plants for two chestnuts. Wait, back. that's a that's a steal. <laughs> yeah, it worked out really well. Well, they had extra chestnuts, and I had yeah. the extra valerian. Yeah. Um, this tree, there's a partner a little further over that is loaded with burrs, uh, so they the wind pollinated, but there's no chestnut upwind of this friend, mm. so this has nothing. I'll add another chestnut in the hedgerow there so yeah. that they can get pollinated. It'll, it'll work itself out over time. Yeah. These were here, and so it's working around. So the context was already established. So from the lawn onward, it was pretty much entirely closed canopy. And so the thinning and clearing work was about creating light opportunities mm -hmm. and the chance for new successional pathways that have more diversity and mm -hmm. more yield. The work in this context was to say, Larch is here, and I, I am appreciating their existence. So who can we plant in the understory that mm -hmm. can tolerate the shade? And so there's Nanking cherry, there's yasta berries, there's bamboo underneath that don't necessarily love the shade, but they mm -hmm. can handle it. And then there's cornelian cherry, which is a cornus moss, which is remarkable at its ability to produce a very strong crop of really high quality fruit in complete understory conditions. So the larch stay and we get fruit. Amazing. So the idea of, you know, you have to clear in order to make space for an orchard, I think is only true if you get locked on a particular tree type and it requires full sun and you're not, 
you don't have latitude. I just wanted fruit. Yeah. So this works, and then we don't have to we don't have to kill the overstory. And it looks like you have some native, maybe blackberries or so down here, or yeah, black caps. Kind of black caps. Okay. Some and then, ground tried... covering poison ivy for the <laughs> shade tolerant herbaceous layer. Have you uh, have you tried um, maybe like currants or gooseberries, or is this too much shade? Do you this think, is or? on the threshold of a little too much shade, but okay. on the whole boundary between this context and the lawn are currants. Yeah. And black currant of all of the current family that my experience uh, are the most shade tolerant mm -hmm. and also productive. Hmm. Red, white, and pink and, and yasta berries on the edge, but we keep trialing more. How do you use the Cornel uh, Cornelian cherry? Sasha does all the magic bits. <laughs> so what she's done, there were years in the past, we collected really ripe fruit late in the season and she roasted them like tomatoes. And it was like a roasted oh. tomato scent, yeah. but on vanilla ice cream. You just have to pick the seeds out. Yeah. But it had like a toasted, caramelized, really deep, almost savory flavor, but still lots of sweetness. Wow. Uh, there's wines and jams that you can make. And you know we'll figure that out over time. It took them about eight years to start bearing. So we're just yeah. coming into having enough of a crop to start thinking like, what do we do with it all? Do the wildlife care for it at all? Not so much. Not the so beauty much. part too is deer never ever chew. I've never seen deer chew on these. That's interesting. But they kind of go for other dogwoods, don't they? Probably, yeah. yeah. But these and uh, Kosa dogwoods seem to just be left alone. By yeah, them. yeah. It's our native dogwoods. Oh, yep. that's twangy. A little it, early in the season. I yeah. would not. Well, give it a shot okay. if you want a, a nice little twang. Wee. Ooh, that is astringent. A <laughs> that month, will dry your mouth a right month out. too early, but it's still fun. <laughs> if I was salivating, that would have cleared it right that up. That would have worked you right <laughs> up. Yep. You get some box elder in here. Yeah. yeah. They were they were here. I don't know. They're they're fast and they're wacky. Yeah. They're not, they're not in anybody's way, so they They stay. kind of fool you when they're young. You're like, is that poison ivy or yeah. not? <laughs> it's a tree form of poison yeah, ivy. Yeah, exactly. That you can touch. <laughs> these look like rhubarbs. <laughs> yeah, so these are the non-native cousin of Colt's foot. So Really? I don't know the Latin name. This is Fuki. I know of this as Pedicites japonicus. Okay. But I don't know Colt's foot. But okay. they're in the same family. It's so like in the early spring. When you think you see dandelions flowering, but yeah. it's way too early and it's in the ditches, yeah. those are the little colt's foot flowers. Yeah. These will be at the exact same time making flowers that big. Hmm. And they're, they smell like wintergreen and honeybees love them. It's like the very, it's like snowdrop season yeah. for browse for bees. Wow. So they're incredibly shade tolerant, real wet affinity, ground covering. They're really great to plant where we have poison ivy. I see because they just, they, they overrun it. Yeah, and they shade it out, maybe? Mm -hmm. Is that... And then we can use a scythe to cut, if they start yeah. encroaching or being problematic, they are expansive. They're, they're pretty intense plants. Right, do you harvest them for food or are they just kind of there to suppress the poison ivy? Traditionally, it would be the stalk early yeah. in the season in Japan yeah. that would be cooked in a particular way, not unlike a poke root style. Like, okay. there's a rules of engagement game. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't boil it twice and change the water, like that kind of right, stuff. Right, right. Uh, I know Sasha tried doing something with them. It was bitter to the point that it was for the chickens and they weren't into it. <laughs> so whatever it wasn't the traditional, or maybe it's a traditional more on the medicine yeah. spectrum than food. Yeah. Or, um, or like let it sit underground for like 14 days. And right, <laughs> yep. yeah. But if you ever need a real quick hat, they're like just, they're- Or an umbrella. An umbrella. Yeah. They'll get a lot bigger too. These are actually, they get, believe it or not, more sun than they'd like in here. Ugh. This patch gets even more shade. And they're kind of, I mean, they're kind of cool in the sense that it's, it feels like, it's not the shape that I would say Jurassic Parky, but because they're so large, like it reminds me a little bit of a Gunnera or something like that, you know, hmm. but a, a cross between a Gunnera and a rhubarb. <laughs> I don't know Gunnera. It's like one of those, um, Oh, they get those really big leaves and it grows into marshy areas. It's okay. very popular in the UK, but I don't know if they would be hardy Interesting. here. Interesting, yeah. yeah. These are hardy and and robust and expansive. Yeah. And challenging. I Yeah, I would never ever suggest like plant them where you see ladies mantle and trillium and <laughs> yeah. ramps. But it, this is a pretty, this had a history of being pretty roughly manage as hayfield and mm. probably sprayed apples back in the day. Mm. And a lot of the vegetation that's coming up is like stress response vegetation. Mm. And Fuki kind of is like a good band-aid. Keep the soil really even and cool and moist. Mm. It's good habitat for little creatures. And that browse for the bees feels crazy special. Yeah. Like first 
first, you know, Snowdrops and Fuki are like yeah. the first flow. Yeah. That's really nice. This gets a little more, this needs more Fuki. This is poison ivy in here. So this seems like a proper garden over here. I would say proper. I would say just like a more traditional. It's in rows is what I'm it's saying. It's in rows. <laughs> well, it's a trick. It's, this is going to be a pond someday. Oh. And so what, what my friend Juan and I did is we used the electric BCS with the rotary plow. This was a, uh, where the previous owners dumped all their woody debris hmm. for like 15 or 20 years. So super rich, super fungal. And we took the coarsest woody debris out and brought it out of the footprint of where the pond will go someday. Mm -hmm. And we can take a look. But now there's hugel mounds on contour or raised beds with a woody interior mm -hmm. on the outside on contour. Mm -hmm. And then we shaved into the soil a few inches. And if you actually look from a distance, you can see that we, we actually extracted about 200 wheelbarrow loads of topsoil from here. Mm. But because it's vegetated, they bring it back up. And so right. aesthetically, you don't sense that it's gone down. Right. And so each year, so right now it's in carrots and there's lettuce and there's amaranth and there are potatoes and there's kale and daikon and beets. And then next year we'll do another pass of harvesting topsoil, sending it to other production spaces and go with slightly more water loving crops mm. like celeriac and celery and lovage and then another pass and then it'll be in rice and then another pass will actually start to sketch out the fullness. So this will end up being probably a half acre pond uh, ultimately, but we can do it over like five or 10 years and yeah. get soil get carrots and squash eat you know each year move a little bit more towards the context that's happening from that excavation it's such a counterintuitive way of like doing a pond because it's not like you get an inst instant gratification of having a pond but you are getting instant gratification every year almost you know of different crops that you're harvesting so i love that successional layer of like moving towards a pond it's brilliant and you just have to have some patience for it i guess <laughs> yeah but there's enough other stuff going on yeah that's like it's not like we're standing here like why isn't it a pond yet? yeah like, we're we'll the just, ducks <laughs> yeah we'll harvest more soil when we need it we'll cap other production areas that are outside of the scope of this and yeah. then we'll we'll get there when when's the time to do it the landscape here is becoming more and more wet over time. Mm. And as we walk, you'll see why, like we've been building more swales and ponds and water holding features higher in the landscape. Right. And so I think the whole water table is more consistently high. Mm -hmm. And so some of these trees that were really big are and end under wind load are a little more fragile. Um, but the idea is we cut the trees that when, they, when they fall to lengths where they could then be shaved with a draw knife and turned into like round pole yeah. structures later on. And what's your view on the ash trees that are unfortunately going? Yeah, well, 100% not going to intervene as far as, you know, chemicals or any of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Also, would absolutely not just cut them all down mm -hmm. because they might die. Mm -hmm. And so then there was a pretty strong ash dominance in this glade and in a few other spots. And so there's a two pathway, two forks that we follow concurrently. One is in areas where the ash have big open form and are starting to decline. We're not cutting, we're under planting to shade tolerant long-term uh, trees that can mm -hmm. replace them. Mm -hmm. So the real, the perfect analog, the perfect swap that I found is American persimmon. Mm -hmm. They are shade tolerant in their mm -hmm. youth they need more light in order to fruit later on, but they'll get that as the ash, yeah. you know, it's just succumb. Uh, and then this way the ash can remain as snags for wildlife. Like I, I don't have no intention of cutting them when they've fully passed away because it's just a like great habitat for yeah. birds. And, and then that'll be a, a release both in the root zone and in the light access for persimmon to come up, hazelnuts, um, pawpaws, Believe it or not, walnuts seem hmm. tolerant enough. Juglin's clam oh, yeah. seems to do it. And the squirrels are I'm taking their lead. They've been planting bitter nuts and black walnuts and all sorts of nut family crops around the ash in anticipation of their passing. Yeah. And so I'm just following their lead and adding English walnuts and hickory and pecans instead. And what I learned from like one of our forester friends is that uh, you know the branches may break slowly, but it's never like they just topple over. Yeah. So it's it's something that probably won't damage a fence or anything along the lines because it just is a slow, yep. a slow burn. Yeah, where you can see there's piles. 
off, basically some of the white pines have lower dead branches and mm -hmm. we use those as like lumber holding. Yeah. And so where I've thinned white ash or found completely dead standing that there's enough of them that it would be nice to have the opening. With the electric chainsaw, they'll be cut. They're stored in the branches of the pines to slowly cure and dry. Yeah. And then we'll peel them with a draw knife and they'll become building material. Mm. So I'm building a shed right now that's 10 feet by 22 feet. And between the black locusts that we harvested and peeled and split for free from a local person and the white ash, the entire wooden structure is zero dollars. Mm. It's like 20 bucks in screws to build the structure. Yeah. Oh, did I get bit? Poison ivy, mosquitoes. Uh, I don't know. What Everybody's that is. out to get you. <laughs> I think it looks worse than it is. I know. <laughs> I it is know. worse than it I looks. Think, I think I got, um, I think I might have got thorned. Looks like you took that pool knife on. Uh, I know, yeah. I know. Yeah, see, a persimmon, they can kick it in the shade. Oh, yeah. And this, I put this one here because the Scots pine above died. Yeah. And so there's so much liberation of, like their whole root system is just being digested mm -hmm. by the earth. And so the persimmon is capturing that and putting it in their body. So is this persimmon, there's English walnut and then black wall, or um, black currant. Can they handle the walnut, the juglans? Uh, persimmon seems okay with it. I don't think okay. they love it, but English walnut, yeah. juglans regia, yeah. white walnut is a weird term. <laughs> um, they exude way less juglone. Okay. So we don't explicitly add black walnut as plant. That's happening enough. The boundaries yeah. of the property are really strong with it. Yeah. So we're adding in juglins, which is different types. And Can you just explain to, that? What mm -hmm. is this chemical in the yeah. soil, right? Yeah. yeah. Juglone, the, what, it's a root exudate. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what that means. Except that black walnut, the way I see it, is it basically can create a potion that has huge influence on who can grow around them. Uh, yeah. It's like an allopathic kind of chemical that says, you don't grow here, it's, you, you get a free pass, so you don't, you know, yep. so. And, and Canada goldenrod is very similar to that. Like it's, it seems to be, even though it's native, it's very aggressive. Mm. And part of it is because it has those allopathic chemicals that kind of go out into the environment. Mm. Um, you know, eucalyptus is the same way for people who have like, taken eucalyptus out of the environment and put it elsewhere, that has and it all becomes a eucalyptus forest. And mm. it's hard for other species to grow there. But yeah. the fact that you could have that and you also have the uh, persimmon, it's interesting that it could be, there's not many companion plants, you know what I mean? I would imagine, but it, with the testing, that's cool. Well, black, the test, we have black walnut in the landscape and I, it felt important to just like have empirical notes about what actually seems to thrive. Yeah. Not as tolerant of black walnut, but actually that like grows really well yeah. in association. Papa adores it. Like they really? can't get enough juglone. That's funny. The, maybe even, I wonder if it produces more chemicals as it ages and maybe less as it's younger or how, you don't know. They're mature, yeah. like big, healthy black walnuts. The, yeah. Of all the pawpaws we planted, the ones in direct association with walnuts, absolutely are way bigger, make bigger fruit and it's tastier. Ooh, fascinating. Black cap raspberry, love, we all know, like anywhere yeah. the black walnuts are, black caps yeah. are generally there. That's great fruit. Elderberry, completely fine. Yeah. Mulberry seems to do just fine if mm. there's enough light. Mm -hmm. Hazelnuts, okay. Yeah. Persimmon seems okay. And if, if that was it, so to speak, of mm -hmm. like, here's this overstory tree that wants to be here anyway, mm -hmm. will rain down fat and protein most yeah. years, yeah. makes dappled shade throughout the summer and then yeah. lots of sun in the swing season, and we can get pawpaws and mulberry and elderberry <laughs> and maybe persimmon and maybe hazelnuts. Like, okay, that's I feel, fine. I feel like I just asked you the question of like, if you could take a set of trees on an island, what would they be? <laughs> it would be all the trees. But you know, if the island is loaded with black walnuts, I know yeah. who I'd want to bring yeah. at this point. And I want to keep trying other things. And since we're a nursery, we can afford yeah. to plant extra chestnuts and yeah. apples and say like, okay, yep, they are not black walnut yeah. tolerant. I don't like it. This pathway, this was what was here, just to give some context. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I, I wouldn't have personally designed a mowed pathway that are like these straight lines mm -hmm. and intersectional mm -hmm. like streets, but it was what was here. Mm -hmm. And so the path of least resistance was to continue keeping it that For way. For sure, yeah. But if you can imagine, it's a little hard to now, but basically from here to the west end of the property, five years ago, there was the mowed pathway 
and then it was 100% impenetrable with um, European buckthorn, wow. Japanese honeysuckle, Oof. an overstory of Scott's pine, yeah. uh, some other characters in there. And so by clearing and resetting that successional pathway in a different direction, so it's yeah. still in an early successional path, it's super light. Let's go down the middle. Cool. Let's go to the center path. I, I feel like the sun is beckoning us down that way. And that's the most the most intense activity in the landscapes happening on this. This is where we had the potential for the most light with yeah. the least amount of total like late successional canopy reduction. European buckthorn, I have a lot of love for them in the work that they do. Like I've definitely seen that in super tight, really wet poorly drained and really beat clay soils, mm -hmm. European buckthorn's able to crazily decompact and add porosity and organic matter. I'd be tempted to use it on our land, but <laughs> it seems like it could be aggressive. I'm not saying that I plant them, yeah. but when they show up in the landscape, to me, when I need more light and access to do other things, yeah. when I cut them, I know that's a place to put a plant that would like better soil. Right. And so a lot of this glade in here is was European buckthorn. And I didn't I didn't burn them out. I didn't use an excavator mm -hmm. to dig them out. They're simply cut a lot of times pollarded and then coppiced to slowly reduce their canopy mm -hmm. and intercropped with other plants and then eventually cut flush to the ground mm -hmm. and scythed for two or three years. And now it's going in a different direction. Right. And they left the wake of way improved soil. Yeah. So I appreciate that they're here. Invasive, blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. I'm invasive too. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. I might as well find something nice about me. If, yeah. You know? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get to judge, really. No, it's also the, like you were saying, the respect of like what the land was, you know, the path of least resistance. Okay, fine. We'll mow here. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, working with what you have and then slowly transitioning it over time. Yeah like nudges and suggestions once in a while a little bit of a wrestling yeah but not like my will shall be imposed right you know and and the whole observe and interact game with permaculture is so important of like mm -hmm. try a thing and then give it some space to give you feedback before you try it again see what you might want to modify mm -hmm. and i asked you this in the last tour if you had some kind of plan on where you're putting things and, you know, I still wonder that, like even here, like you, you obviously put this structure up and you put a, some type of squash on here, right? So I'm kind of, I'm wondering, like, is there a way where you're like, oh, this would be perfect for this? Or are you just kind of one little step at a time? Yeah, that one. Yeah. One little step <laughs> at a time. Uh, you know, this, this was like, it just would be, I had this idea, like it would be neat to have a trellis system in here. And there were a couple of ash in here, including the one that, is now pollarded really high with mm -hmm. all the regrowth. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine came out and helped me. I got on the ladder and cut it. And so the part that was cut is what goes this way. Right. But yeah, so we had a couple extra ash, did an incredibly technically deft and thoughtful <laughs> wrapping job here of some garbage found metal. And it holds up well enough. And so yeah, this year we've got loofah gourds and birdhouse gourds that uh, our dear friend Juan was growing mm. and we, we thought it'd be fun to see what they would do. But then underneath is hardy kiwi. Oh wow, that's gonna be an aggressive guy, yeah, right, yeah. eventually? Yeah, so we're, the hardy kiwi is getting established. You can see they're actually weaving their way through the annual. Right. And so we'll hopefully get a lovely yield mm -hmm. of, you know, because the trellis is shaped this way, mm -hmm. once they're on the top and it's sturdy enough, they can hold in suspension, these birdhouse gourds and loofahs so they can be a clean fruit. Yeah. And then the kiwi can ride the annual to get their selves up to the top mm -hmm. and that'll be the later successional vine right. layer. Yeah. We'll see that what happens. Sense. Maybe hops would go on here. Mm. Maybe shisandra or, you know, some other thing happens. But I, I want to do more of these, but just more like teepees of ash. Was this already planted in the landscape? It seems pretty old. Yeah, this is a pear. It gets fire blight yeah. and makes pears that I don't really care for yeah. and not annually. But it's really a beautiful tree. The flow of browse for bees in the spring is phenomenal. Yeah. And the deer adore these pears. Um, well, that's good because you attract them with something that you don't adore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I like deer being yeah. here. It feels sweet. Yeah. Um, and I think because it has fire blight, it, show, it does show disease mm -hmm. that 
we have grafted Asian pears and European pears in this landscape. Mm -hmm. By leaving this with that disease, it kind of selects for, like if the other trees catch from this and succumb or have issues, I'd rather have them catch them and succumb and pass away so there's a gap for something else mm -hmm. than intervene all the time. Like right. there's no way I'm getting on a ladder and pruning out any yeah. branch that's burnt from, so You're it's basically a, selecting for the healthiest, you know, of, yeah. of, you know essentially with that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And is this senna or this one right here? Yeah. So this is a nice nitrogen fixer. Lovely. Did, it, did it plant itself or did you plant it in? That one would be a volunteer. Okay. There's little blocks of senna throughout here. Uh, for a little while I was being a little bit more intentional and in co-planting uh, an overstory tree with a nitrogen fixing mm -hmm. perennial. And senna is completely deer proof. Yeah. Um, and it's native, isn't it? Is it sure, a native? Sure, I think so. Yeah. Uh, native, non-native, yeah. I don't... You don't select for, you know. I definitely don't select for yeah. and I... It's not like I, ex I explicitly try not to know. Yeah. It's just, it's not part of the criteria that matters to me. Interesting. I'm okay. interested to know the plant as a being, their body type, their role in an ecosystem, the services they mm -hmm. can offer to others, what relationships they can have, mm -hmm. and whether or not they were here a thousand years ago or a hundred years ago matters less. Mm -hmm. So it's like I wouldn't bring garlic mustard to this space. <laughs> right. But like I'm interested to work with who they are. Right. And you know, like senna could be an amazing native companion to support the non-native apple. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit arbitrary, mm -hmm. those who are invasive yeah. or not. But yeah. apple, I find kind of, they really disperse. They and, have. You know, they're challenging. <laughs> like they're cool though. Yeah. So let's bring them it's in. It's like we don't want to call the things that we really like invasive. <laughs> well, if they have economic benefit to yeah. a certain class of people. Yeah. Then yeah, it's a whole whole interesting. It's as place. American as apple pie, though, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Wait, yeah. apples are not American, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's all it's it's interesting and it's really worth exploring and looking at in a more full and open way. Yeah, for sure. One of our criteria that we're looking for in our meadow is like what what is the analog like a uh, mm. quote unquote native analog that feeds insects, not as a pollination product, but as like. Uh, the insect eating its mm -hmm. its foliage, and so I've started to do a little bit more research in that. And and actually, for for that project, I am trying to give more credence to the um, to the nativeness of a, of a plant for the benefit of like insects. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't mean that some of the non-native plants actually still feed the insects if they're cl more closely related. You know. Right. Yeah. I I think yeah that that. When in doubt, if there's a native that can plug into a certain context, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And that's really for the reason you mentioned. And then there's also, if we zoom out a little, for example, autumn olive is like the quintessential most hated <laughs> shrub layer non-native. In our landscape, which has had a legacy of degraded agricultural use, mm -hmm. autumn olive can be aggressive, but because they are, they're doing reparative work. Mm -hmm. and. The argument a lot of times about autumn olive is they don't support natives, but I see huge diversity of bees, mm -hmm. honeybees too, which are non-natives mm -hmm. that we are fine with, mm -hmm. but a huge range of bees that occupy the flowers on them. Mm. And then the fruit is useful to a really wide range of native and non-native birds. Mm -hmm. And they're nitrogen fixing, and they create an amazing nurse habitat mm -hmm. that can be where a chestnut or a hazelnut or an other native late successional tree can be fueled, protected from deer, and mm. brought up to the canopy. Mm -hmm. So then the autumn olive can be cut mm. later once their work has been mm. done. So they're, you know, completely free everywhere, maybe not, but like yeah. as an element of support to transition to a more native context, yeah. they're an ally actually. Yeah, and clearly you're obviously taking a more nuanced view with it and, and also looking at the application of it based on the local ecosystem that you're working with too. So yep. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then this seems like you, you have a, these could be like a really nice cut flowers if yeah. you wanted, <laughs> it's but also herbs. Medicine patches. Yeah. This is yeah. all, uh, it's Tulsi and ashwagandha, our characters that we Your favorite. added this year. I already smell it. Yeah, I didn't even have Feel to rub. Feel free. I didn't even have to rub up against it. If you see half of this being gone by the end of the day. You, you can know. harvest, <laughs> where, what we were trying to do is we are waiting to do our main bulk harvest for mm -hmm. drying until the last stack of flowers finished, which they're just about there. And the idea is this way the 
because the, the crazy range of bees love mm -hmm. this plant, mm -hmm. and it's so special for them that it's like one little flower yeah. left. You know, it's getting we're very you know close. It's getting used. So then we can cut this very low, mm -hmm. bulk dry all that material, and hopefully have the timing right that it can make another full flush of flowers mm -hmm. as a fall browse. So like. You know, golden late goldenrod season is another yeah. browse for the bees before it frosts. And then once it frosts, we'll go through in between and find where the ashwagandha was growing, which is a, a solanaceous medicine. It's a root crop. Mm -hmm. And that first frost will get their energy back into the earth so we can dig them up. Um, and then this will transition to maybe a nursery bed next year with the hope that some Tulsi self-sows. Yeah. We can keep growing them. So you cut this once and then you'll have it flower again. Where would you cut it? All the way at the base? We would cut it pretty low. We did a little harvest just to release some ashwagandha that were getting covered. And so we don't cut it flush at base. We cut it in a bunch of spots low to stimulate way bushier regrowth. Okay. Uh, and that just gives, you know, because the harvest is the leaf. But for a full medicine, it's like to have the leaf, a young flower, a middle-aged flower, and then also seed. Mm -hmm. it feels like a fuller medicine picture from a plant. So that yeah. we like if that can happen. And the yarrow is here, so we just planted around them. That's been really sweet to see how well that works. Like a yeah. little pruning of yarrow here or there just to keep the space for the novel annuals. But they'll be here afterwards and this will be a, a nursery bed for yarrow. And the, the yarrow just loves this section for some yeah, reason. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's like if it, if it planted itself, it obviously knows what it's doing. <laughs> I had nothing to do with the yarrow. Yeah. Other than just, you know, working supporting them when it felt like they needed it, but they really don't need much. It's a lumpy landscape. This is, this had been plowed and tilled and smoothed so hard for so long that it felt only right to get some lumps back into yeah. it. It's what, you know, Pit and Mound is what this whole region would have been. It would have been treed heavily mm -hmm. with tons of blown over trees and all sorts of textural change. Mm -hmm. We, the soils here, are, they're uh, Angola silt loam. It's a really weird series, super tight, very shallow to bedrock. Mm -hmm. Like three feet is the deepest we have for soil on wow. this whole landscape. Is it very compact on top? Super tight, yeah. crazy tight, yeah. very slow draining. And so when this was an overstory of Scott's pine, mm -hmm. European buckthorn, if you came out here in like the first week of April, first of all, there's like no herbaceous, there's nothing in yeah. the herbaceous moss. Yeah. And it would be sopping wet anaerobic soil all over under the trees. Yeah. And then by summer, it was huge cracks in the soil. And so the clearing of them without the soil disturbance helped the herbaceous layers there, they wanted to come back. But then digging ponds and taking the material from the ponds to make berms and burying wood in those berms mm -hmm. makes these crazy, like every, every one of these planting bands is from like, 50 to 100 or 200 wheelbarrow loads of the result of digging a pond somewhere nearby. Yeah, I mean, it's so hard to imagine what you're saying, what it looked like before, because this is obviously a hugely productive landscape. And, um, you know, but I, I empathize with you because we have very similar soils. I think Volusia silt loam, mm -hmm. and it has that really hard compact layer mm -hmm. on top. The rest of it actually seems pretty fine. And we're probably a little deeper than, than you are, but my goodness, like the, the amount of productivity that you're getting in this space <laughs> is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Well, it's because it had been extracted so hard for so long, mm -hmm. the, the design imperative of a, a nitrogen fixer in association with a later successional plant is pretty critical here. Mm -hmm. And so like, you see, these are sea berry mm -hmm. and they're amazing nitrogen fixers. And then the friend that's tucked into them is a plum. Mm. And they're they're planted about eight inches apart. Yeah, very close. And then there'll be an autumn olive with an apricot. Mm -hmm. And there'll be senna next to chestnuts. There'll be lupins next to so apples. Will you cut this eventually to let the plum grow? Or how do you or do you keep them eight inches apart? They'll be eight inches apart. I've I the whole thing of like you need twenty-five feet between yeah. trees. I've never seen nature do that. Yeah. Like I've seen 50 year old sugar maples that are two feet in diameter yeah. next to 60 year old hickories that are two feet in diameter. Right. And they're, they were three inches apart. Yeah. They're like, their bark merges. They're so yeah. close yeah. and they're fine. They just lean yeah. a little out. Yeah. So whatever. Sea berry is easier to harvest when mm -hmm. you cut branches because mm -hmm. you can then sit down and turn them and pick them. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably 
if the plum seems like they're upset and they surely don't seem sad or mad to me. Mm -mm. So right now there's no intervention to even think about. Mm -hmm. We'll just keep the golden rod down a little and the poison ivy down. Mm -hmm. And then so we'll keep the sea berry managed and have the nitrogen release happen when it's time to harvest fruit in the future. Everybody who plants too closely together is cheering right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think if you plant too, too close together and patentedly never want to do any pruning, mm -hmm. any sort of cutting whatsoever, mm -hmm. you're gonna go down some pathways that are tough. Yeah. But if you plant close together with the idea that pushing and pull, some plant bodies will get bigger, some will get smaller, and a little nod towards success, like that plum will be a tree, mm -hmm. the sea berry will be a shrub. Right. So they'll stratify anyway. Yeah. And so then it's just more about like facilitating if I sense that there's stress. Mm -hmm. But most of these plants are not C4 pathway plant. They don't need 14 hours of sunlight to mm -hmm. grow. So they're, that amount of shade and competition is actually like relaxing for yeah. them, it feels yeah. like. And um, then I noticed that you have like, it's in season right now, but sweet Joe pie weed. Yeah. Um, is this something that came up? You said you have a wet area or is this something that you've actually planted? Joe pie was here. This one is a, just was here and felt beautiful. Why, mm -hmm. why intervene? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's dog bane. You know, there are a lot of real wetland indicators that mm -hmm. were kind of here. And are you probably going to get more and more of this if you're, if you're saying that your landscape is going to get, you know, a little more moist, you uh -huh. know? Yeah, but that's what a scythe is for. It's yeah. like if right now it's like there's random grasses. Yeah. There's all sorts of plants that we didn't plant. Uh, there's winter squash forming on the far side, yeah. but nobody here is in the way. If they were to start being a challenge to the squash, I could use the scythe and cut them yeah. and deposit. It's green manure, it's, mm -hmm. it's fertilizer, it's mulch, it's life. But in the meantime, it's browse for bees and they're crazy beautiful. Mm. So just work around them. One of, one of the best native plants for insects to eat, actually. Awesome. So that's just great. I want to let you know that. <laughs> yeah. They, and they're, 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 they're funky. They're just a really, yeah. it's like a bean. Like, what yeah. are you doing? Yeah. You're a it's, crazy it's, plant. <laughs> it's funny. It's related for people who are houseplant enthusiasts. It's actually related to the Hoya and they get that like very similar seed pod hmm. and, um, or, and, and also related to uh, milkweed. Oh, yeah. I remember somebody so telling me that. In the that. same family. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And I think actually it probably has. Probably does the yeah. latex game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And cordage, right? You can yeah. do like rope and string yeah. with them. So it's got its it's got its place. Yeah. Is this a multiflora? Oh yeah. Oh, and you just leave it there. Yeah, I shaped <laughs> it up so I can have the walkway, but that's <laughs> that's a nice browse for bees yeah. too. And I don't know, February rolls around and I'm working in the landscape and there hasn't been direct sunlight mm -hmm. for sixty days and it's five degrees out and there's bright red fruits hanging. Yeah. That's you could use the rose hips, I guess. Yeah. I eat them yeah. all winter. Yeah. Like they are a major part of my brows in the yeah. way. Like yeah. I, when I'm outside working, I, my water will often freeze, and so I'll like it doesn't hydrate you that much, but I'll sometimes <laughs> do like rose hips and snow. Mm. Maybe I could go back to the house and get water. It's not yeah. dire, <laughs> but it's really pleasant, <laughs> and the amount of vibrancy and fre like fresh fruit in February yeah. in our climate is insane. And, they're invasive, they're blah, blah, blah. But that's crazy to be able to have that. Yeah. So I love them. I, okay, we're gonna leave one multiflora rose on our land. <laughs> I'm not planting multiflora everywhere, but you know, and you can see, I actually, I manage it as though it's a plant we planted. Like yeah. I, I need a walkway that's through That's why here. I asked, because it's like, it's like a little, it's like, it's got a centerpiece, you know? Yeah, yeah. it gets pruned just enough so that yeah. the pathway stays open. I actually was hilling potatoes and I used the multiflora prunings to mulch the hilling, mm. uh, just to keep the, the moisture in the soil. Um, What's this behind here? This little shrub. Uh, red osier. Oh, nice. And then a, oh yeah, I see the little red stems coming up. Yeah. Yeah. And then a ridiculous sea of winter squash. <laughs> I'm so excited to see what comes of that. The winter squash is like overtaking the red osier dogwood. Yeah, that's cool. It's just for a little while longer. Yeah. They'll, 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 that was actually an, uh, another value I found in autumn olive early on is to put a little pile of compost on the south of an autumn olive and push climbing winter squash seed. They find the autumn olive, they climb like crazy. And autumn olive, it's a strong- It's pretty sturdy, Structurally yeah. really yeah. legit. Yeah. And delicatas and butternuts provided nitrogen by the autumn olive, so mm -hmm. they love the fertility. Mm -hmm. And then being able to climb, they can completely cover. And then their fruit forms in suspension. They ripen 
Like the most evenly ripened winter squash you've ever seen are from dangling off a shrub. And then in the fall, I can harvest autumn olive fruit and the winter squash. Yeah. And then we can do cucumbers or yeah. tomatoes or some other vine on that shrub later. I think like for, you know, you're, you, uh are talking about companion planting that you know no one I feel like no one's ever tried before. <laughs> I'm sure like, people. I'm know, sure I'm like just the one of many. Random. It's 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 wonderful. Well, like, that's that's part of the whole idea with this is yeah. to ask questions about not just not say like what do I want, right? But what's what's happening here anyway? Mm -hmm. What was the history? Wh where are things likely going to arc and send uh, on their own devices? And what are the bodies and the shapes and of these beings I'm working with, along with what I want? And what can happen there? Like this could be a scaffold for a vine. And we put mm -hmm. the thornless blackberry near the sea berry mm -hmm. with the idea that eventually we can send, because they like a little bit of a trellis, mm -hmm. and so they can lope along and be supported by the sea berry. And again with the plum nearby. And then a squirrel is like, yeah, that's not complex enough. You need a black <laughs> walnut. So we'll leave that for a while and yeah. see if the plum is juggalo intolerant. If it isn't, I probably would cut the walnut. Right. But we'll see. Maybe the plum dies of a disease. And so then we get black walnuts here yeah. instead. Oh yeah. If there are any left, please feel free. Mm -hmm. I'll give one to Sonder. Yeah, it's the very tail end. That's an early ripening variety called orange glow. Sorry, it's, it's still, still good. good. It's still worth it. <laughs> we, we were in unison. <laughs> yep. That's as close to a tangerine as you're gonna get yeah. right now in this in this region. I hear a little vole squirkling away. I heard that one, yeah. <laughs> I found one when we were putting in tree circles and oh, yeah, I got to pick good. one up and I was like, you're so adorable. And he's like, what did you do covering my hole? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not adorable, get off me. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I had two little orange teeth, yeah. Yeah, they're little rust colored teeth. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty crazy. So yeah, there's certain areas that are like potentially really high value nursery. Yeah. Where we respectfully decline the visiting of rabbits and deer. <laughs> um, this is again, scrap fencing and like old tea posts we got either for free or cheap. I don't, I don't think I have it in me to do perimeter fencing for this property. We could afford, you know, it would pay for itself as far as crop yields and all that, but I, right. um, having the, the vast majority of the landscape be wildlife porous mm -hmm. and then just occluding where it's necessary mm -hmm. feels like the path that works. And it's, it's surprising when there's enough going on how little you sense the deer pressure actually. Well, yeah, I mean, you are providing way more than you could probably ever need yourself, right? So yeah. it's, it's, cra it's a silly amount of production you know, we don't sell food crops. Yeah. We're a nursery. Yeah. But then, you know, to plant like elderberry and willow mm -hmm. takes no time at all to mm -hmm. plant. So we put in like hundreds of cuttings and the deer definitely are chewing mm -hmm. these. They're keeping them to like this height. Mm -hmm. But when they go dormant in the fall, they'll just be like more shrubby. Yeah. And if somebody doesn't want to buy one because they see a deer browse, then we'll plant it or yeah. give it away. It's yeah. like whatever. That's what I was uh, sharing with Sonder too. I was like, I like my, I like the groundhogs. I'm like, we'll just have to plant them a garden. <laughs> yeah. I mean, saving seed from kale is like not a big deal. Yeah. And sowing it in areas where groundhogs hang out, you know, they'll, they'll plow through it. So you gotta like re-sow. They're like rototillers and, and lawn mowers in the same body. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I always can tell if it was a groundhog, if it looks like a bowling ball and a lawnmower came through. That was like, <laughs> that's groundhog browse. That's what it feels like. Um, where should we go? We can look over here. Yeah, if let's you want. do it. Um, just lots of, it's a mix of wild space and nursery. It's like, this is all a bed of pawpaws that were sown in the fall. A lot, a lot, a and lot. And these of, are ones that you'll um, pull up to sell or? Yeah, this isn't their final home by yeah. any stretch. Uh, pawpaws take a little while to come into a nice robust size. So these are first year. Mm -hmm. uh, are more, you planting a certain cultivar or are they just kind of a mix of things or? These are a mix from a really nice orchard that I think may have been destroyed between last year and this year. It was, the, it was supposed to be. It's a Cornell orchard that a friend of mine collects from. Mm. Um, and so we, we, we collected as much fruit as we can. So we have like right. maybe around 10,000 or so pawpaws. Wow. 
not in this bed, but just spread in a bunch of places with the idea that maybe that gene pool is gone. Yeah, yeah. So they'll they'll grow here. Did the orchard get intentionally destroyed to to replace for something else, or was it like I think for sale? Oh, I think to to be housing development. I see. So there, that's you know, like there are these places, research institutions where they grow certain plants, but it's for research. It's for like there's like a agricultural or a financial goal. And then right. when that research and that grant money is done, like dries the, up, yeah. the innate long-term value of the plant isn't part of the metric. So like right. they'll get erased all the time. Like I've seen these crazy plantings of hazelnuts and just go because there's a different experiment to happen. Right. So like kind of uh, not rescue, but like collecting those genetics to get them out so they have a chance to be grown out feels pretty important. Yeah, and the legacy, I guess the legacy will live on, you know? Yeah, So just seedlings. And as seedlings, instead of grafted plants, then there's that openness. You know, evolutionarily, they, they can go in a lot of different pathways. Mm -hmm. Like these are more, this is more papa. This is not one of your blackberries that are <laughs> that without <one's> thorns. <laughs> yeah, um, it feels like plants are like, don't go. That's what it feels like. Or something, maybe they're just like, get away. It's That's like, like I never wear a sweater outside when yeah. I'm in the garden. <laughs> um, these are in air prune boxes, which is a theme we work with a lot. So these are, they're made out of black locusts, so they'll last hopefully a lifetime. And this one's uh, a riser, and then they basically have mesh on the bottom, mm -hmm. and there's an air gap. So underneath. when the roots hit the air gap, they kind of cut themselves off. Yeah. So. For a nursery, and to, to get really good, healthy seedlings mm -hmm. that are very adapted to Ooh, that was, that was a rabbit, um, to growing out in a field context, rather than having really long, very skinny roots, mm -hmm. the more you have a fibrous, short, stout root system, the easier it is to dig a hole for the plant, and the more feeder roots it has in the O horizon, like mm -hmm. in the, the organic uh, matter layer. And then also we can put caps on these to keep chipmunks and squirrels out. So again, like not saying we don't want to put poison and traps for chipmunks and squirrels, but we do want to say you can't go in, the, in these 20 square feet, right. you can't go. Right. And I'm sorry. But then we take the caps off later in the season and they root around and they get the remnants of the nuts. It's more for hazels and um, chestnuts. They the have squirrel. plenty to There's have. Opportunity. You know, there There's is, opportunity. There's other opportunity here. Um, but yeah, the air prune pattern you know, we have rhubarb from seed, and mm -hmm. this is um, river locust. So Ooh, river locust, oh, I don't know what that is. Um, Amorpha fruticosa. It's um, blue false indigo bush. Oh, okay. So this, I think this one's native. This will become like a 10 to 12 foot tall shrub. Yeah. Fabiaceae, so nitrogen fixer. Mm -hmm. And the flowers are ridiculous. They're yeah. Like royal purple and yeah. gold and Honeybees in particular seem to really love them. And they, they're completely cool. You can like three, four times a year, you can whack them with loppers. They have no spikes, so you can use them as a, it's like alfalfa in yeah. shrub form. Yeah. And so these are second year in the same air prune box. They just sat here over winter, exposed to the air, like freezing cold. <laughs> they're that hardy, they just didn't mm -hmm. care. And so we'll, we'll lift this this fall and then fall sew this box to like a sweet Sicilian. Yeah, and what you're using here is still the hardware cloth, but then just regular uh, crates, or not crates, pallets. Um, pallets, yeah. Yeah, the trial here was, what does it look like to get four foot tall stand? So this is half inch by one inch. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna get too crazy with geeking out on it, but um, a little bit sturdier, so it should mm -hmm. last a little longer. And so four feet and then folding it up eight inches on either side, so the sides are the metal itself and just putting them on pallets. And the idea is to leave this, to leave these air prune boxes in position for two years mm -hmm. or so. Worm castings, leachings, crazy fertility, complete weed suppression, and then move them to somewhere else and that's where a tree goes. Right. So it's like sheet mulching or occlusion with plastic, but instead it grows like 5,000 trees in exchange for a planting spot for one tree later. Right. And so that the idea is to have these just like every two years move to a new spot and then replace it with a guild. Mm -hmm. Eventually the whole landscape has to become trees. Like that is, it's a, a rule that nature won't, <laughs> won't let me get past. Yeah. And also my body, do I wanna <laughs> fight that till I'm dead? So we'll be a nursery like that sells, this will be a forest eventually. Yeah, <laughs> whether I like it or not. So 
will be a nursery selling plants for now, and then mm -hmm. eventually, maybe if there's an economy, be a nursery that sells seeds and cuttings mm -hmm. instead of the plant. So it's like becomes more a DIY nursery. Like here's information, here's cuttings, here's seed, but it's a closed canopy system. We're not digging anymore. I know you mentioned your parents are retired, but how do they interact with your the landscape that you've planted here? They just if at all. They don't really, but they're sweet about it. They're very supportive and and they like people showing up and they, my mom likes to give tours and tell people what's edible. She doesn't know what is or isn't, <laughs> but she likes to say like she, she had there were a group of people and she's like these are these fruits are edible. I was like that's Japanese honeysuckle, mom. Don't <laughs> But, but it's sweet, she, like, she yeah. likes to get into it. So. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I don't know, they, they're, it's wonderful that they're, um, they're open to the idea of the land that they don't really, the back end of the property, uh, that it can go in these directions. Mm -hmm. I think they appreciate what that means. Well, I am interested in the way that this does go to forest, what it will eventually go to forest too with everything that you planted in here. You know, it's gonna be a very interesting set of woods that you have. <laughs> yeah, and, and probably in like the long time scale horizon, like 200 years out, yeah. the vast majority of my efforts here will be erased and it'll be pretty much all black walnut because <laughs> that's what the squirrels would rather have. And I'll just like pretend that I have some effect on the destiny. I mean, I don't know, there's there's a lot. We have planted a few thousand trees in here. Yeah. And, there probably will, I feel like persimmons and there the There will pawpaw. be some vestiges, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it'll be here for a little yeah. while. You can see our earlier tour on Sean and Sasha's one half acre permaculture farm here on the channel. And feel free to follow them at Edible Acres. If you'd like to see more of these videos, give it a thumbs up and we'd appreciate you subscribe to the channel. We're committing 10% of our Google AdSense revenue back into the Finger Lakes community here which will be matched by our partners, Espoma Organic, which also have ties to this region. In the meantime, we'll see you in the next video.